having every weekend Prabhupada by uh, advanced Vaishnavas, uh, sannyasis over the last one month. And during the weekdays, we have the local devotees speaking about Srila Prabhupada. So we are very, very, very fortunate and happy to have this one as Bhakti 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 Maharaj with us today. You know, Maharaj has been giving his personal association to Chennai devotees for many years, every year, uh, during the, I mean, of course, Gaurapunima Maharaj visits here and then he gives us association. Of, of course, ours is the pandemic, we are not fortunate, but Maharaj has been coming online with us in the past. And today, we, today and tomorrow, we are very, very happy and fortunate to have Maharaj being with us to speak about Srila Prabhupada Kata. So, Maharaj, we are extremely grateful for your mercy to be with us. Of course, Maharaj just finished another class and then just joining. He has been having a back-to-back -back schedule. We let's take full advantage of Maharaj being with us. And uh, thank you very much, Maharaj, for being with us. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. The only thing is, I think those who are devotees who are on YouTube can also shoot the Zoom because you can have any interactive questions with Maharaj at the end of the class. Thank you very much, Maharaj. What do you think? Om Magyana Timurandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Kauravani Pratarine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vancha kalpa terubhyascha kripa sindhu bhayevacha patita nam pavane bio vaishnavi bio namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shri vasade gor bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to think more and go back into the memory tanks, remembering pastimes of my spiritual master and our beloved founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. <laughs> So I had the opportunity of coming in contact with Krishna Consciousness through the devotees when they first came to the UK, when they came to London and they'd met George Harrison and they made records. So that was when I was first introduced to Krishna Consciousness. Harrison 
Then later on, I graduated from college and I was working in London and uh, I purchased, I happened to see a Krishna book in a store one day and I purchased that book and took it. It was only the first volume and it had a big silver cover, a big picture of Radha and Krishna on the front and a big picture of Srila Prabhupada on the back. So I was already, you know, a spiritual seeker. I'd been reading books by different spiritual teachers and I was very attracted to this one. And when I took the book home and showed it to my friend, my friend was impressed and he told me, he said, you know, I have a book by the same person. And he searched through his books and he came out with a copy of a smaller book, The Topmost Yoga System. So we were both very impressed to see these books, that they were very, uh, that there was something very unique and I took the, the time to go and sit and read the book and I felt deeply impressed that I thought this is a book which I feel like I've understood it. I'd read a lot of other books by different spiritual teachers, but I never felt like I could understand what they were trying to say. But when I read Prabhupada's book, I felt everything he say, was saying was so clear and I really felt that this had, is, is everything I agree with. So after getting these books then, both my friend and I, we started to visit the temple. We went, would go there and attend there. And there was one French lady there, later on I found out her name was Mundakini, and she was a pujari. She was taking care of the Radha, Radha Landanishwara and Jagannath Baladev Subhadra deities which were there in the temple. This was in the year 1971. I was about 22 at the time, or 21 at the time. I'd just come out of university, graduated, and I was working. So this French lady was telling me that she, well first of all she was the only one taking care of the deities and these deities at that time they were the only full-size deities of Radha and Krishna 
in any temple in ISKCON at that time. So this French lady was always talking to me about Prabhupada and she would point to the picture of Prabhupada you know, as the founder Acharya, we had a big portrait of Prabhupada there hanging on the wall. And she would always say, Prabhupada is going to come very soon. And practically every day, whenever I went to the temple, she would talk to me about Prabhupada and she would say, Prabhupada is coming very soon, he's coming very soon. So I've been coming to the temple regularly. And so they encouraged me to start staying overnight and attend the morning program and then go to work in the daytime. So I would go to work after the morning program, I'd go off to work and I'd come home in the evening, they'd keep me prasadam and I did like this for a few weeks and then now after a few weeks they told me, they said, you know, you give up this job and you just work, be here with us all day, you don't need to go to work. So I thought about it for a day or two and then I decided, yeah, it's a good idea. I gave up my job and I just became full-time devotee. And I was given some engagement, I was given uh, the service, I was, we were having some, we were manufacturing incense and we would distribute it to the shops and I was given that as a service. So the French lady, Mundakini, the Pujari, she was always saying, Prabhupada's coming, Prabhupada's coming. But somehow Prabhupada never showed up. And then it happened, we were getting ready for Rati Atra. Uh, so at that time, but then it was confirmed that Prabhupada is going to come for our Rati Atra. Yeah, Prabhupada, you know, different temples would always be inviting Prabhupada, although we didn't have a lot of temples, but still there was like maybe like maybe 30 temples and different centers in America where they were very active and they wanted Prabhupada's presence there. And then also India, Prabhupada wanted to develop India, so Prabhupada was putting a lot of his energy into India. In 1971, there was really nothing much there in India. The devotees had only just recently come there to India.
Anyway, we were in, I was in London, we were doing uh, our preaching work in London and there's a, quite a few Indian people there in London and they hadn't really started supporting the temple. Somehow the temple was going on. I, I never could really understand how we managed to survive in those days because we really didn't have much income. We had no real source of income except from the incense which I was making and we were distributing. And we didn't have many books at that time also. Bhagavad Gita had not been printed by uh, the, the full Bhagavad Gita hadn't been printed. We had a, only the abridged edition, which was printed by Macmillan. And we had also Ishopanishad had been printed, and Nectar of Devotion had been printed. One more book, Nectar of Devotion, East Yes. And then uh, we had Krishna Book Volume 1. And we had Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavatams from India, the first canto which Prabhupada had printed in India before he'd gone to the West. So the only books which we had for sale, we had some boxes of Krishna Book Volume 1. And we had also some Back to Godhead magazines. So when we would go out on Sankirtan, we tried to distribute the Back to Godhead magazine. When I joined the movement, initially the program was that we could give the book and if people didn't give any money, it was no problem. We would allow them to take the book without giving any donation. But then Prabhupada saw that the temples were taking books from the BBT and they didn't have money to pay for them. So Prabhupada said the temple takes books from the BBT, they have to pay for the cost of the books. And a letter was sent, a letter was sent, I don't know, I think it was written by Prabhupada, but a letter was sent to all the temples and the letter said that everybody should, every gentleman, they should give at least uh, 25 cents, you know, it's a quarter of a dollar at that time and, and that was it, supposed to cover the cost of the Back to Godhead magazine. And Prabhupada said if, if they cannot give a quarter, then they're not a gentleman and they have, you know, they, we can't just give the books away freely. Everybody has, they have to contribute for the books. 
பணத்தை கொடுக்கவில்லை என்றால் அவர்கள் சிறந்த நபராக கருதப்பட முடியாது அவர்கள் குறைந்தபட்சம் இந்த புத்தகங்களை அச்சிடுவதற்காக தங்களால் பிடித்த இந்த நன்கொடையை நிச்சயம் வழங்க வேண்டும் என்று கூறினார் So that was the beginning of the book distribution you might say that we understood we have to get we have to get the money from the book So mainly we were trying to distribute the back to Godhead magazine because to distribute a big book we thought that's really difficult we take maybe one big book with us when we would go out but mainly we try to distribute back to godhead magazines naangal indalar mudhalavarku bhagavan darshana naadhai mattume dhaan kondu selvadude or kaiyil oru puthagangalai vendumana veithikolvom yenendral adhu periya puthagamanade vilpanai seivathu endradhu migam kadinamaanadhaaga irundathu perumalavil indha bhagavan darshana naadhai naangal vilpanai ekku kondu sendru kondirundhom Over the years the Back to Godhead magazine has gone through some changes. In the 197 in 1970s the Back to Godhead magazine was meant for mass distribution and it was suitable for people who didn't know about our movement. In the Bhagavad Darshan naal edaranadhu kaala pokil peru maatrathai erpattiyathu 1970-galil in the Bhagavad Darshan naal edai padithavargal Krishna unarvu endral enna endradhai purindukondradharku eduvaga karuthugal amaithirukkana But now Back to Godhead is an like an in-house magazine is meant for people who are all members or congregation of our society ஆனால் இப்பொழுது அந்த பகவத் தரிசன நாளிதழ் என்பது நமது அகிலோக கிருஷ்ண பக்தி இயக்கத்தில் இருக்கக்கூடிய பக்தர்களின் வீட்டு நாளிதழாக ஆகிவிட்டது so in the, in the, in proper time it was different it wasn't it was only that there was a color on the cover and the inside of the magazine was all black and white prabhu padarin kaalathil anda puthagamanadhu muthu verupettirundathu puthagathin the mele mattume vanna padangal podapattu adu irukkakoodiya ullae irukkakoodiya pakkangal anadhu karuppu illai kaagidathal achirapattirundathu so we were pretty much supporting the temple by book distribution it was the main source of income and you know i would also give something i was doing the incense business and i would sell get some sales and whatever money we made i give to the temple naan appo ad samayathu oodupattigal thayarichirundhen naan adilirundhu varakoodi maduvaiyene kovilin paramarippu panigalukkaga valanguvathirundhen that in those days our temple was really ashram based all the devotees were living in the temple we were about 20 devotees initially aaramba kaalathil naangal naangal poduvaga 20 bhaktargal irundhu andha kovile paathukondu avalipaadu seidhu kondu vandhu i remember when i joined I, there were on, there were two or three ladies and there was like 18 19 men naan seyndha podu irandu allathu moonu penmanigal irundhargal 18 alathu 19 aan aangal irundhana Hmm. And we were we were young you know i i was a bit older i was 21 avpode avargal anaivarume iriya vayil irundargal naan mattum 21 vayil irundhen asamayathil there was one indian man who was a devotee later on he became subhag now he's subhag swami avpode ore indian irundhar avargalude per subhag ipolde avar subhag swami I was impressed when I saw the Indian man had also joined and became a devotee. Naan oru Indian kuli maganavar ipo bhaktaraga maari irupadai kandu migavum aathiriya padaithe. So anyway Prabhupada came and that was when we all got initiated. I remember a uh, prophet giving us all initiation we all sat in the temple room and prophet sat there and chanted on each of the beats before our initiation naangal anaivarum kovil irukkakoodiya arayil amarndu kondirundhom ungal munbaga sila prabhu padra adhu deepikana maalayil japam seidu kondirpadai naan paarthen 
and when we came forward for initiation, then Prabhupada wanted to see that we would recite his pranam mantra correctly. Right? We, our names would be called out, our karmi name, and we would come forward and we would offer our obeisances and Prabhupada would tell, say loudly, say out, say out loud and we would have to recite Prabhupada's pranam mantra loudly. So then Prabhupada would say, what are the four principles you're going to follow? How many rounds are you going to chant? And then Prabhupada would give the beats and give our name. So I was when the day I was initiated, we were about fifteen of us all got initiated. And I remember Mahavishnu was initiated, now he's Mahavishnu Swami. And Subhag was also initiated, now Subhag Swami. And I also got my initiation along with them. So uh, we were very fortunate, we all got initiation, but that afternoon Prabhupada called for the temple president. Pres temple president at that time, he was from USA, his name was Dayananda. And so uh, Prabhupada said to him, he said, you know, I gave all of these men initiation. He said, none of them give me any Guru Dakshin. And Dayananda said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, they don't have anything. They don't have any money. <laughs> anyway, it, that was something, that, that was the situation of our temple. Our temple was, you know, it really had no funds and somehow or other it was just maintaining by the grace of Krishna. <laughs> Each of us who had joined the movement, we would give whatever money we had, whatever we had in our possession, we would surrender that for the service of Krishna. So after Prabhupada, after that, Prabhupada said that, so then we went for Harinam Sankirtan. And whatever collections we got, whatever profit was there from Sankirtan, we gave that to Prabhupada. So it wasn't very much. So it was a sign of Srila Prabhupada's mercy that he kindly accepted us despite our very poor economic condition. I think, I think Prabhupada understood that, you know, these young men, they're, they're giving their lives to Krishna, so it's not so bad. So Prabhupada coming to London, 
was always a big event and many people would come to visit him. Different newspaper reporters would come to see him and interview him. It was like, you know, at that time the guru was something very it was something very big in the news and there were there were other bigger gurus of course who were more famous. There was like the Maharishi who'd been the guru of the Beatles. And then there was also this uh, Rajneesh, who was also very big. He had a lot of money and a lot of followers. So the reporters, they understood, they saw Prabhupada as being a genuine spiritual master and they wanted to get some, you know, they wanted to create some, uh, some kind of news, or make a big story for themselves out of their interview. So they tried to get him to criticize the other gurus. And they would ask Prabhupada things like, what do you think of this guru, that he's got so many big cars and he's got so much money? And they saw Srila Prabhupada that he was very simple and looked like he didn't have much money. Srila Prabhupada would live with us in the same building in the temple. We were in a place, in those days we had a rented house, it was number seven Bury Place and uh, it was like about five floor houses, it was a very old house so. So there was a basement and the basement generally would take prasadam there. The kitchen was also in the basement. And then the temple was on the ground floor. And then Prabhupada's room was on the next floor. And then there were two more floors and then there was an attic above that. There were two more floors and then there was an attic. Attic means a room above in the, in the top of the house, in the roof. So Prabhupada was living with us and you know we didn't have vehicles really, although we somehow we'd taken a very old car to drive Prabhupada around in. It was not really roadworthy, but we were using it to drive Prabhupada. And they saw the devotees also. We were dressed in usually things like bed sheets, and it was, uh, you know. The days in London where the weather's always pretty cold and wet and we would have to wear socks and sometimes the socks were like one red and one blue, you know, not always a, a pair of socks. Uh, 
ஆண்களை தாக்கு கொண்ட வேண்டியிருந்தது அந்த தாக்கும் பார்ப்போமை என்றால் ஒரே நிறத்தில் இருப்பது இல்லை சிகப்பு நீளம் என்று வேறு வேறு நிறத்தில் நாங்கள் தாக்கு கண்டித்து கொண்டிருக்கக்கூடிய சூழ்நிலை ஏற்பட்டது so people would see us and they could understand you know we're not exactly wealthy people appozhu makkalengalai paarthu andha alavukku engalukku porladaram illai endradhai purindukondargal and there are other spiritual groups who are very very wealthy very prosperous anal matra aanmeeku kuluttan miga miga valarchiyagum migavum sugal vaindavargalagum irundargal so the reporters want, wanted to get probably to criticize some of these other groups but probably would simply say that oh the the bona fide guru he may ride in a big car and the guru who's a cheater he may ride on the bicycle you cannot judge who's genuine by the vehicle they're riding apol da varthinar or angitharikapatta guru anavar a rolls roy car ilum sellalam or sadharana guru anavar cycle ilum sellalam guru anavar edhil selgindraal endradhai veithu nam guru vin thagudhiye niyamanam seiya mudiyadhu endru kuriyar so um you know this was something of a revelation for the reporters to hear prabhupad speak like this it was a real education for them prabhupad taught them you cannot judge the spiritual teacher just by simply external things like the vehicle On another occasion Srila Prabhupada came to Hong Kong and it was arranged that he would be picked up in a Rolls Royce and he would stay in the penthouse suite of an exclusive hotel in Hong Kong. Appol pore Srila Prabhupada Hong Kong ku varige kurindar avarai varaverpadarkaga Rolls Royce car aanu anupapatirundathu avar miga vasathiyana penthouse suite engindra edathil thanguvadarkaga anaitu yerpaadugal so at that time the reporters also picked up on that and they said to prabhupada they said you know you're a swami ji your uh, swami ji is a like monastic people and here you come in this rolls royce a very expensive car and you're staying in this luxury hotel appozhudhu ang patrikyalargal vandu sila prabhupada re kaanal kandanar avargal ketanar neengal un swami ji suravarathu irukkoodiyavar and prabhupad responded to them saying if i was to sit under a tree you would never come to see me appozh prabhupad kurinar naan oru marathadiyil amarthen endral ennai paarpadharku neengal varamaatteergal on another occasion when reporters questioned about prabhupad having an opulent car prabhupad would say in the spiritual world in the kingdom of god they they will have uh very celestial chariots made of gold and covered with beautiful jewels apporu murai maru patroru murayum idhe kelviyanadhu sila prabhupadaram ketta bodhu பிரபுபாதி <laughs> what they give in the spiritual world aanmi golagathil kodukka koodiya andha andha ragathai ivargalal kodukka mudiyum endru naan edirpaarkka mudiyadhu ivargalal mudinda alavirkku enakku valangindrargal adhai naan ketukkolgindren endru sila prabhupadar padilalithar so prabhupad always knew how to get his message through to the reporters in very clear basic language 
சில பிரபுப்பாக தான் கூறக்கூடிய விஷயத்தை எவ்வாறு இவர்களுக்கு எளிமையாக அடிப்படையான மொழியில் கூற வேண்டும் என்பதை நன்றாக தெரிந்து கொண்டிருந்தார் Another very amusing meeting which Prabhupad had with the reporters in London it came in the Bhaktivedanta manner on a very winter's day very cold windy wet day So anybody who's been to England you know you know something about the weather there it's not very pleasant you know especially winters it can be very cold and damp and wet and so this reporter young woman came there to meet Prabhupad and she came to meet Prabhupad she was dressed in a mini skirt So she was talking to Prabhupada and she was asking him, why do all your men have to shave their heads? Of course, in the 1970s, you know, most people had, you know, it was a fashion to have a good head of hair, particularly young men, they like to have shoulder length hair. And here's this young woman coming and she sees all these men with shaved heads and she thinks it's really strange. You know, people in London, in England in those days, they were not familiar with seeing monks with shaved heads. It was a very new thing. So the young woman was requesting Prabhupada, why these young men have to have shaved heads? So Prabhupada noticed how this young woman was wearing a very short skirt, a mini skirt. And Prabhupada said to her, he said, he said, they may have shaved heads, but their legs are warm. He said, the men may have shaved heads, but their legs are warm. And Prabhupada was indicating to the woman that she was the unfortunate one because her legs were not covered, so her legs were cold due to the cold weather. So Prabhupada said to her, better to have warm legs and a cool head. But he said, you, you have cold legs and a hot head. The hot head means very passionate, lusty. <laughs> So Prabhupada gave her something to think about by telling her like this. Of course Prabhupada had a lot of controversy with male-female things because, you know, Prabhupada was speaking 
about the position of women in the Vedic culture and this was at the time when there was a lot of uh, women working or striving for independence and women's liberation. And Prabhupada would speak about how the women's brain is not the, not as big as the man's brain. It's like something like half the size of the man's brain. So, so women, of course, didn't like this, but Prabhupada said, this is a medical fact. He said, I can't change medical science. So while Prabhupada took advantage of this women's liberation movement to get some to stir up some interest in our Krishna Consciousness Movement, Prabhupada was also very favourable to women. Prabhupada had of course incorporated the first Brahmacharini ashram and he gave women the chance to become the full-time devotees in Krishna Consciousness. And he gave women the opportunity also to worship the deities. We see in India today it's usually always men on the altar doing the deity worship. But Prabhupada allowed women to do the deity worship. And Prabhupada allowed women also to do things like book distribution and to go out and preach. Now sometimes Prabhupada would have, they would have big Pandal programs organized in India. And of course, you know, you get a crowd of people in India, sometimes they get very restless and the audience can make a lot of noise. So, when Prabhupada had some difficulty with the audience and couldn't get them to be quiet, then he would call for one of the young Western ladies to come and speak. And as soon as the young Western woman would come up on the stage and speak, then immediately there would be so much hush, everybody would just be so quiet. So Prabhupada knew how to use these ladies in the service of Krishna. At the same time, Prabhupada was also a little cautious about putting women into responsible positions. Although Prabhupada has some very qualified ladies, we see that when he chose his people for the GBC, he didn't p p select any lady. Mm -hmm. 
He certainly appreciated the ladies and had great respect for them and understood their qualifications, but he was very careful not to put them into leadership roles. So anyway, I, I, I don't want to get too much into India just now. I want to speak more about Prabhupada when he was in the UK because uh, that was where I first saw Prabhupada. And uh, we, we, when Prabhupada came there to the London, we would arrange programs for him in different parts of London, in different suburbs. Yeah, there's different uh, town halls in different sections of London, there would be different town halls and we would rent these town halls and we would somehow make some advertising in a primitive way and, you know, have small programs and take Prabhupada there and take Prabhupada's Vyasasan there and have, have a program. And Prabhupada would give a lecture and sometimes he would ask for questions. So I remember one program we were having and some Christian man stood up with a question and he, he you know, condemned that this, uh, you know, that this is not a bona fide religion, that this isn't Christian, that he's not God and you can't chant his name and you know so many, th th so many things about Christianity being the real religion and the way to Jesus is the way to God, not Krishna. So Prabhupada turned to his sannyasi. There was a, at that time there was a resident sannyasi in London. His name was Ribati Nandan Swami, and he turned to Ribati Nandan Swami and said, "You answer." So Ribati Nandan Swami, he was of. Italian origin, of course born in America, brought up, but the family was, eth eth they were Italian ethnics, and he was tall and uh, powerful, and he replied very strongly to the Christian. And when he responded, then all of the devotees, we all cheered, you know, and we, we thought, you know, he's defeated this Christian, you know, it was so nice, it was so joyful. And so then we, we had kirtan and everybody chanted and danced in ecstasy and Prabhupada was very happy. And then the next morning, on the morning walk, Prabhupada said to all of the devotees, he said, all of you have to learn to reply, just as Ribati Nandan Swami did last night. You should all learn to reply like him. So 
பதில் அளித்தாரோ அது போல பதில் அளிப்பதற்கு நிச்சயம் கற்றுக்கொள்ள வேண்டும் என்று கூறினார் So Prabhupada was training us that we have to be able to preach and we have to defend the Krishna consciousness movement from attacks. When Prabhupada would go on morning walks, he would often turn to us and say, what is that sloka? And he was asking, and you know, sloka from Bhagavad Gita, he would turn and say, what is that sloka? What is that sloka? He wanted to let us know that we should be studying the books and we should be learning the slokas. Sometimes devotees, you know, they don't like to learn slokas, they think, oh no, no, no not required. But Prabhupada liked us to know the slokas. So Prabhupada was also very concerned about the deities, how the deities were being taken care of. I remember one morning uh, we opened the curtains and somehow the, the parampara pictures had been placed wrongly. And Prabhupada was upset. He said, am I the only one to notice these things? Don't you notice? Another time, you know, the, the nature of the temple in Bury Place, we had Radha Landanishwara on the ground level. And above them, above them, on above, above Radha and London, London Ishwara were the Jagannath deities. They were on a platform behind Radha London Ishwara and raised above them. So we had made very nice decoration of flowers all around Radha London Ishwara. It was very beautiful. But we hadn't had time to put everything around Jagannath. And so when they opened the curtains and Prabhupada saw so many nice flowers around Radha Landanishwara and nothing all up on top on, around Jagannath, Baladevas and Subhadra, he said, why like that? He said, you have to put also there. He's all, this is also God. So in this way he was training us about how we have to do deity worship very nicely, very properly. But not only was he training us to do deity worship, he was also concerned about class, how we do, how we give the classes. I remember one morning, you know, I was just a new devotee. I had I'd only been there a, a, a short time. And so somehow we were sitting there in the temple room and it was time for class. And usually all we did at the time of class we would just read from the Bhagavatam. We'd read the old Indian Bhagavatams, which Prabhupada had printed in India, and we'd just read from there. So 
So I remember Prabhupada coming in the temple room and he saw sitting there reading the Bhagavatam. And it wasn't long, just a short time after that, Prabhupada sent a letter to all the temples and instructed how we should have Bhagavatam class and what should be the format. He wanted everybody, he wanted one sloka a day and we would chant the sloka and then we would discuss it. One person would lecture on first of all and then there would be questions and discussion. And Prabhupada personally showed us. He stayed there. He would begin at the very beginning of the Bhagavatam and, and then later on at Bhaktivedanta Manor he be began at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita and he lectured on the, the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita every evening in Bhaktivedanta Manor. Of course, sometimes we'd arrange big programs, we'd have them in a nice hall, and Prabhupada would go and he would be concerned. He would, he would say, What kind of prasadam are you distributing? He would want to see the prasadam. He would look at it, he would taste it, he would say, is it enough for everyone? Did you have enough for everyone? He wanted to make sure we could do everything nicely. So there was one Indian man who had been initiated by Prabhupada and he had three, he and his wife had both been initiated, they had three sons and they were also initiated by Prabhupada and uh, this man, he's a good man, you know, he, he did a lot of valuable service. Later on he went to India and he was the one who got the land uh, where Krishna Balaram temple was built. His initiated name was something like Kirudakashai Vishnu. His Indian name was, he was a Gupta. His wife's name was Kirtida. Kirtida. So anyway, uh, he had some deities he wanted to install and so he asked Prabhupada to come and do a Bhagavad Sapta and he asked Prabhupada to come out to a place called Salto, which was an Indian area where a lot of Indian people lived. I remember because I, I was given the responsibility to take care of the deities. The deities were put there in this hall in South Hall and we would take care, we would stay there and take care of the deities. For, and we were supposed to do a Bhagavad Sapta, you know, for, for one week Prabhupada was supposed to come and give Bhagavatam class. So south of, it was a little far away, it was like about one and a half hours away from London. And 
Anyway, Prabhupada came the first night and gave the lecture and we had the deity installation and everything. And then after the first night, Prabhupada said, I'm not going back there. He said, that hall is terrible. And he told his sannyasi, Ribatinanda and Swami, he said, tomorrow night you go and you give the class. <laughs> so Prabhupada, you know, I mean, he was careful. If he didn't like the hall, if he thought there was not much potential there to preach to a high class of people, he wouldn't go back. But he did go one time. He gave, you know, he went first time. He went the first time. He had a look at it. He saw the place, and he understood it's not very good potential. He didn't want to take the trouble of going there every night. And so then Prabhupada turned to his disciple, sannyasi disciple, and told him, tomorrow night you do it. And so the sannyasi, he did it for a few nights, and then after that, then he gave it up, and he gave it to another devotee, another senior devotee, Trajumna, the Sanskrit scholar. So they did the program, you know, we, it's not that the program was dropped, they, they completed the program, but they just had different speakers every night. So Prabhupada was very much concerned that the temple should be nicely organized and he would check also on the accounts. And Prabhupada sat with the temple president and went through the accounts and checked over the accounts. There was not much money, very small amounts of money, but Prabhupada wanted to see that the accounting was being done properly. Prabhupada knew that we're a that the society was a registered charity there, and that's very important that when you have that status of a registered charity, you have to have your accounts audited every year, and they have to be approved by the government to keep that status. And because we have a registered charity status, then there's income tax exemption for donations. So that's very important. Just like in India, we have income tax exemption. It's very important people giving donations. They can get exemption on their donations. So this, uh, actually the registration done in India was taken from the registration done in London. Initially it was all done in London. They were the first place to be registered officially and uh, to get that status of a charitable society. 
So Prabhupada would come and he would he would check out the building. He wanted to see how we're using the different rooms. He didn't like to see the rooms being untidy or unclean. Everything had to be kept nicely. And of course, Prabhupada cared very much what kind of prasadam we're offering to the deities. Prabhupada himself would eat quite simply. He wouldn't take very much. He would eat very small quantities. Of course, a lot of it would depend on the weather and the climate, particular place. When he would come to England, because it's colder there, so he would like to eat something which was hot, which would put some heat in the body. He would take some utma or some halava for breakfast. And at lunchtime, he would like to have rice, dal, chapati, sabji. And we would have very nice uh, atmosphere. We, we had a lot of fun rushing Prabhupada's chapatis up two flights of stairs so that Prabhupada could get a nice hot chapati. We would, we would run up two flights of stairs to bring the hot chapati into Prabhupada's room. Right, the kitchen was in the basement and so we had to run up two flights to get up to Prabhupada's room. Prabhupada would take his lunch in his room, so we have to run up the two flights of stairs and bring in the very nice hot steaming chapati to drop on Prabhupada's plate. And Prabhupada liked subjis, he liked simple subjis like Loki, the Loki subji was one of his favorites. Prabhupada also liked watermelon, that was one of his fruits which he would like. He would take also some fried nuts for breakfast, like a few almonds, which had to be first of all soaked and the skins taken off and then lightly fried. And Prabhupada liked very much you know, if people were if people were serving them, Prabhupada would always want to know who, who was cooking for me and then Prabhupada would thank them and they thank you very much for doing this service for me. Wherever he went, Prabhupada usually liked to have his own the usual schedule. They go for the walk in the morning before the Guru Puja class. It didn't matter where he was, if he was in Mumbai or London, 
for Los Angeles, he liked to go for a morning walk. The doctor had told Prabhupada this would be good for his health. So Prabhupada began every morning going for a walk. And he liked to walk, he could walk quite fast. At the same time, we had to be very careful that, you know, we tried to get too close and sometimes maybe the feet would, there would be ten, maybe it would knock Prabhupada's foot or something and Prabhupada would have to warn the devotees, don't get too close. The devotee is very eager to hear, but in the eagerness to hear, sometimes get too close to Prabhupada and end up kicking Prabhupada's foot. So I have to be very, you have to be very careful in serving Srila Prabhupada. Okay, maybe I'll stop here. We'll ask some questions. Thank you so much, Maharaj. It's been amazing, wonderful, so many values and lessons that we are learning from the experiences that uh, you had the fortune of being with Srila Prabhupada. Though Maharaj said that uh, you didn't have Guru that did not offer, but uh, Maharaj and his associates have offered their life, they've done Atma Nivedanam in the service of Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, Tandula, Anupur, Tandula, Tandula, I was reading Bhakti Charuswami's book. In Bhakti Charuswami's book, he also describes how when he got initiated, he didn't have any dakshin to give Prabhupada and he apologized to Prabhupada and Prabhupada told him, no, it's all right, you're giving your life. So, so amazingly, Maharaj is saying that how Prabhupada wanted his disciples to be learning in terms of how to reply to people like he was quoting uh, Revanti, Nandan Swami, and then he wanted the devotees to learn slokas, he wanted devotees to uh, uh, no, uh, give class, he wanted devotees to, uh, I mean, serve nice prasadam and even cleanliness in terms of uh, even Prabhupada himself disciplined by the morning walk. Everything, every aspect of Srila Prabhupada's life and his instructions was so many values and uh, uh, lessons, Maharaj. One question, I think probably I did not understand it properly. Maharaj was mentioning that when there was an organization for a week's uh, uh, Bhagavata Saptaha, Prabhupada went on day one and he would not go if there is no potentiality. What should be the proper understanding, Maharaj, when you said that? Well, mainly he made the point, he said that hall was just like hell. He didn't, it wasn't a very high class hall which had been arranged. Previously, when we'd had programs, we'd used town halls, 
But this was in a place, you know, South Ho, it's a, a poorer economic area. And uh, it wasn't a very nice hall. It was just a simple hall with simple chairs. It wasn't. It didn't have a big stage or anything. It was. Everything was quite primitive. So Prabhupada just felt it's not very worth all the journey to go all that way there. You know, one and a half hours there, one and a half hours back every night. He didn't want to do it. In that sense, we understand that even when we organize classes for the representatives of Srila Prabhupada, we should make sure even if it is an hour class, an hour and a half class, we should do the best for them to, uh, I mean, that's that's the attitude and approach or an etiquette of a, a devotee for his own seniors. I'm not with you. You want to, what is it, make a class for who? No, no Maharaj, the big, from there, the lesson that we are learning here is that how Prabhupada expects a standard uh, for such programs. The same attitude should be followed by the present generation for their own seniors and uh, spiritual masters, Prabhupada's representatives, so that we give the best even if it is an hour class, an hour and a half class. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I mean, you don't, you don't want to put on a, a, a program for one week anyway, if, if the place is not up to standard. Yeah, we do, we want to have that respect for the leaders of our movement. Yeah, that, that respect should be shown. So another lesson for all of us, Maharaj, like you know, the, the Maharajas and like Maharaj, that they were not even having a pair of socks, whatever they were able to get, one bread, one two, one three, and then that kind of an austerity is what they have all done to serve Srila Prabhupada. Uh, so it's all an amazing lesson for us to learn. Thank you so much. As I mentioned earlier, Maharaj just finished a class just before Savan and has joined us. It's too late for Maharaj. Unless devotees have some questions on the chat box, yeah, there are one or two. One second. No questions. Yeah. Uh, they're just offering obeisances to Maharaj. Thank you so much for being with us, Maharaj. Uh, we offer our respectful obeisances and expressing our gratitude by loudly chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Thank you for giving me an opportunity to reflect on Srila Prabhupada and I'll meet you tomorrow night. We'll go on, hear more. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. By your mercy, we have been trying to do this for the last almost one month. Now, every day evening, we have one hour class. Every weekend we have advanced Vaishnavas and then every weekdays we have the local senior devotees giving class about Srila Prabhupada Maharaj. We oh. beg for your blessings. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, very good. Considering the 125th year celebration, we are doing it until the, uh, as of now, as of now, until Prabhupada, uh, yes, we can.
Yes. Very nice. Very nice activity. Everyone should know about Srila Prabhupada. Everyone now, you know, we're translating Prabhupada's lectures. We have them translated into Russian and Chinese. And we regularly, we get the devotees to sit and hear Prabhupada's lectures. And then we have questions also after Prabhupada's lectures. It's a good exercise for the devotees. It's very good, every devotee, they should be familiar to hear Prabhupada's lectures and to develop an appreciation for listening to Prabhupada's lectures, increasing their knowledge of the Krishna conscious philosophy. So there's so much to be heard, so much to be learned. Tamal Krishna Goswami was writing his PhD thesis about Srila Prabhupada and one of the main points which he made was that there's just so much material about Prabhupada. What? So much material about uh, Srila Prabhupada. There are so much things to read about Prabhupada. Yes. Tamal Krishna, oh, you understand. Can you say Tamal Krishna? Tamal Krishna Maharaj, you understand that Prabhupada is the material that we have to read about Prabhupada. There was just so much recorded material and written material and then letters and just, oh, it was just endless. And so doing research, you know, so often when people do research, you know, these things are scarce. But in Prabhupada's case, there's an abundance. The, the task is made more difficult because it's just so much. Hmm. Oh, would you like to instruct that there are, I mean, every, I mean, at least the assembled devotees are all having taken charge of Srila Prabhupada. So there is one thing that everyone should be connected with Prabhupada every day. Is there one instruction would you like to give Maharaj so that we can aspire to do that without uh, fail to the best of our capacity? Well, Prabhupada's main instruction, I think, is to chant the holy name. That we shouldn't forget to chant the holy name. So we'll always have our bead bag with us. And Prabhupada also told us, he said, we should always carry Bhagavad Gita with us. He said, wherever you go, you should always have a Bhagavad Gita with you, so that when you meet people, if you're talking about Krishna, you can use the Bhagavad Gita to preach to them. Another, another time in New York, I remember in New York, Prabhupada wanted his picture taken sitting beside Tosi and he, he was chanting and he said, this is all we need. He said, Tosi Maharani and the Holy Name. You know, he said, this is all you need. So he was saying, you know, you don't need all these big temples and all the deities. Oh, they're all right, you know, have a big temple, have deities and so on. But what you really need is to be able to take shelter of the Holy Name and Tosi Maharani. Mm -hmm. 
பின்னால் பெரிய கோவில்கள் வைத்திருப்பது எந்த தவறும் இல்லை இறுதியில் அமைதி இறக்கமைதி எளிமையாக இரண்டு விஷயம் ஒன்று பகவானின் புனித நாமம் மற்றொன்று துளசி மகாராணி So Prabhupada like this. Thank you, Shana Maharaj. Prabhupada. We take, we take a lot of inspiration from you, Maharaj. Like, I, we still remember, as you mentioned, uh, you have been so inspiring when, when, whenever we hear about book distribution. I still remember uh, your holiness uh, doing book distribution in China, even without the language barriers and so many things. Even during rainy days, Maharaj will always take one or two books and he will just go stand near any of the uh, shopping entrances and so many other places and he will distribute the book and come back. So we take a lot of this. Uh, பெருமளவு So many books, so many people. In China, we have so few books. Compared to the people, number of people is so great. Number of books we have is very few. So I have a small request. Maybe tomorrow you can just share that wonderful uh, uh, distribution or preaching activities in China. We learned it all. So please, uh, it will be very useful for us and will take a lot of inspiration. நாளை மகாராஜர் அவர்கள் சைனாவில் எவ்வாறு பிரச்சாரம் செய்தார் புத்தக விநியோகம் ஈடுபட்டார் என்பதை பற்றி கூறுவோம் போது நமக்கு பெருமளவில் உற்சாகமானது கிடைக்கக்கூடும் ஆகவே அவரிடம் இதை பற்றி பேசுவதற்கு விண்ணப்பம் செய்கின்றோம் Well and it's not really possible because we're we're illegal there first of all we're undercover so we don't want to say too much about what's going on in China நலத்தையும் <laughs> You know, one time, maybe you remember one time, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, and, uh, and he'd gone there to China and they'd had a big program and what happened, the police had come and everybody had got deported from China. So it was about three or four devotees, Western devotees, including Tamal Krishna Maharaj, they were told to leave China, were given three days to get out of China. So the newspapers contacted the temple, you know, they wanted to get a report, they wanted to know what happened. But Tamal Krishna Maharaj said, no, we don't want to say anything. They don't we don't want to say anything because we don't want to agitate the china government we want to keep as much as we can we want to keep a good relationship with the china government because if if they wanted they could come down on us and they could stop everything because they know everything that's going on they have their people everywhere 
So we have to be very cautious and just try to do everything, whatever, as much as we can. And we try to make some small progress. Prabhupada wanted that we would go there and so we're trying. Just like Russia, Prabhupada went to Russia. Prabhupada went 1971 to Russia. At, at that time, Russia was communist, it was not open. But Prabhupada went there and Prabhupada met the first devotee and preached to the first devotee and initiated him. And he, he was one of the main forces to help introduce Krishna consciousness around Russia. So, Prabhupada, you know, he, he, he saw, he understood that there was great potential there in Russia, that people in Russia, they believe in God. So it's quite natural for them to take some interest in Krishna consciousness. But even in Russia there's opposition, even now, although Russia is not communist anymore, but still there's a lot of opposition in Russia. The devotees in Moscow have a very difficult time. They could not get proper land or a proper building. So although it's not communist, they told me it's the same people in charge. The people who were in charge during the social communist times, they are the same people who are still in charge of the country today, although it's not communist anymore. The, it's the same people running the country. And the general objection is that they want the Russian church. They don't want the Indian church. They feel Krishna consciousness is the Indian church. And they want the Russian church. They don't want the Indian church. So everywhere people have this material concept of God. They're thinking God's Russian, God's not Indian. So people are not very well educated about these things. Everybody is in the bodily conception of life and it's hard to get them out of that bodily conception. So similarly in China, you know, they, they, they try to encourage the people that take up Chinese culture. Remember, you're Chinese and you should take up Chinese culture. Don't look at other cultures. So, 
So Chinese culture is 5,000 years of atheism. Actually, there's not, never been theism in China. It's always been materialistic and atheistic. Makes it difficult field for introducing Krishna consciousness. Okay. So anyway, I'll meet you Thank tomorrow. Thank you so much, Manaj. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna. Thank you.